the light in my paintings, I think, is is more important at, at times than the subject matter. Sometimes subject matter is mundane. It's very simple. It's a ping pong ball or a cue ball or a simple generic bottle. But it's what the light is doing that creates that emotion. The cool thing about making art is even though we're mostly alone in our studios making it, we're not alone on the creative path. All of us are here, no matter what you make. And there are people ahead of us, and always, regardless of when we begin, people behind us. We just simply gain knowledge the further we go. The longer one has been on the path, the more wisdom acquired. Today we're talking to Guy Deal, a Bay Area still life realist painter who for over 50 years has been involved with creating a life centered upon art. His early childhood challenge of dyslexia was relieved by art making and then he just simply never looked back. He's peered into all kinds of artistic genres, often spending a decade of passionate investigation into any he felt drawn towards. For the last decade or two, Guy has focused on making these incredibly alluring still life paintings. His mastery of acrylic paint and materials is unparalleled. His sustainable art practice, make art no matter what attitude, is inspiring. So come listen to the wisdom of the art and life of Guy Deal, a fellow traveler on the creative path. You can find images of Guy's art and links to learn more by going to arttolife.com and clicking on podcasts. Join Guy and me now for this really fun, informative conversation all about the art making journey. Welcome to Art to Light, a podcast for the creatively curious. My name is Nicholas Wilton, and each week I'll help you rediscover not just the art of your life, but the art in your life. Join me as we explore that perfect blue at twilight, the wild frontiers of art making, and the extraordinary joy of finding your way as you go. So, Guy, listen, thank you for this conversation today. I super appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you for the invitation. I've been seeing your work. I'm in the Bay Area, and I know you're in the Bay Area, and so I've always admired your work. I've seen a lot of it. It's realism, and it's, I mean, it's just such a different world than, than the way I work, which is, you know, and I just have always admired the kind of detail and the focus and, and just just the, the beauty of your work. And I was just excited when, you know, you, you said yes. So anyway, why don't you maybe just catch us up? I know you've been in, in the Bay Area a long time, but just a quick, you know, I want to spend most of this conversation talking about what you're doing now and everything, but clearly we let's just drop in. I know you've, you've been in this vein of work and being an artist your whole life. So maybe just give us, catch us up a little bit. Yeah, I think um, from day one, I think I realized, especially through moving to California, my family moved here in 1960. But prior to that, I lived in Pennsylvania outside of Pittsburgh. And I guess, you know, when people ask me, Guy, why did you decide to be an artist? And the answer I have is out of necessity and out of fear in, in respect to I'm dyslexic and have been all my life. And um, my folks, you know, growing up in the 50s, you were always diagnosed as, you know, a disorder. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you have a learning disorder. And, you know, um, Mr. N- and this is, you know, your son is, you know, falling back in his grades and this and that. And um, so my folks were pretty concerned as a child. I didn't, you know, I knew that I had an issue, but you're a child and you're, you're always hanging out with friends and having fun and doing things. And I was drawing, you know, from kindergarten on. I mean, I always had a sense of, you know, trying to make things that in my family couldn't afford, you know, say, well, can I have that toy? And no, no, I can't afford it, you know? And so they would, I would do a drawing of it. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I would satisfy these urges to to have things that kids always wanted. And and you're, just to clarify, your learning challenge or, you know, the euphemism, whatever, it was just mostly around reading, right? And word comprehension. It was comprehension. reading and, and spelling. Yeah, comprehension. Uh-huh. Yeah, it was really, you know, real difficult. And I would say that most of my 
life through my through high school and even into college, it was very, very difficult getting through classes and, and when there was a lot of, you know, reading required. But I think um, what really got me thinking about art was in the 50s, Alexander Calder was commissioned by U.S. Steel to build a, uh, the biggest mobile. So they supplied him with the materials. And, and my dad was a, an electrical engineer, and he was always curious about things like that. So after Calder had assembled this, uh, this very large uh, mobile, it was exhibited at the Carnegie Museum. And I guess I'm about eight or nine years old, maybe no, not even that, probably seven years old. So we went to the Carnegie Museum and I saw this mobile hanging from the ceiling. And as a child, it was huge. It was just gigantic. And that was my first probably real exposure to fine art. And unbeknownst to me, you know, Calder was just this thing just hanging. You know, what is this, Dad? What's going on here? (laughs) Wow. But that same day, we were walking through some of the galleries and I saw these paintings on the wall. And I went, wow, that's really interesting. You know, that's that's cool. It just clicked. There was something there to just turned on this switch about being an artist uh-huh. and being a fine artist. And even though I didn't know anything about it, you know, most of the most of the art I saw was in the Catholic Church that I went to, and they were paintings on the on either side of the uh, the altar. And I was just overwhelmed and amazed by how realistic they. Did. How does someone do that? How do they do that? Yeah, right, you know? right, right. And I had to find out. I had to find out. And it wasn't so much the religious content. It was just the fact that these figures were being executed. And I asked my, you know, my mom, and she goes, well, somebody painted that. And I went, what do you mean? It says, well, they have paints, you know. So, and I was familiar with paints, but they were always kind of the little $2, you know, $1 set of watercolors you got as a kid, and along with your crayons. Right, right, right. So that kind of got me thinking, well, as a dyslexic individual, you know, what can I do? And it's all nebulous. It's, you know, trying to figure things out. But the recognition I got from from people was that I could draw things yeah. realistically or close to realistic. You know, there were I would draw submarines and and in perspective. And um, this is probably third grade, fourth grade. And I think that's that was always held to my heart, you know, that I like doing this. I like creating a, a sense of realism. And, um, and it kind of offset the struggle I, I've had, you know, with dyslexia. The computer has helped me a great deal over the last probably 20 years in terms of, oh, right, of you know, yeah. of reading. And I have the computer read to me when things are too long. But for writing and composing, I mean, all that is just I wish that, you know, it was available when I was growing up, but that wasn't the case. It was just, it was all new to, you know, to uh, teaching. How do we, how do we help these? Yeah. And it, and often, and, you know, I, I had a similar thing. I mean, I can so relate to what you're talking about because I didn't have, I don't know what I had, but like hyperactivity or something. Yeah. I don't know what my problem was, but the local school wanted to put me on, I think it was Ritalin, and they would kind of sequester the kids that they didn't quite fit, which I didn't. I couldn't right. concentrate. There you go. And I was really into art making and model making. I mean, I was so into it, but I, I wouldn't be naturally inclined to sit there with flashcards and learn math, you know? Oh, yeah. But I was kind of labeled, I don't know, whatever. It was, I had a pro- disorder, you know? I mean, it's yeah, just, yeah. It's just horrible what... I mean, today it's like every every friend of mine practically, you know, one of their kids has some learning challenges, you know, and they, they you know, you just have to like spend a little time and figure out the best way to for that child to learn. But I too, um, I mean, I was good at art, and and it's funny, you know, and in, in even in high school, it was it's really important to be good at something, you know, just something. You just, That's true. You know, it really. So I, I can relate to that because I. I wasn't good at sports. I wasn't, you know, but I was able, like, I I was that kid, you know, I was that kid that that did art. So I I get it. And and, and I loved it because of that. Or maybe I loved it before that, but it it certainly didn't hurt. And and so I can see why you kind of went into it. Well, I think I think we share something in common here in a sense that, you know, we're trying to find our identity. And nobody's telling me I'm going through grade school in high school and even in the college that it was okay to be dyslexic. I took a, I took a good 
friend to tell me that. And when it was said, I went, it is? <laughs> you know? yeah. and, and, and at the same time, you know, I surrendered to that. I surrendered to the fact. And, and now I, I'm open to discuss it, you know, because I'm in a position, I think, in my life where I want to give back. I want to give back to, in any way I can, in terms of being creative or, you know, a mother with a, with a son or daughter that's dyslexic and can't figure things out. I want to say, hey, you know, they've been giving this, they say it's a gift now, and then I, I would go along with that. You're given a way to interpret the world in, as artists do, as a visual person. I know a lot of dyslexic artists. It's amazing. Yeah, you know, once me they, too. Once they confess, you know, yeah, and they yeah. admit, to, admit to you, and they go, oh, yeah, you know, I have trouble, you know, writing. I can't, I can read, but I can't spell, and this and that. And I think that's, it's important, you know, that a child needs to have other ways to venture through their, you know, their informative years. My folks weren't very supportive. They were just confused and, and frustrated. And they encouraged Art to like, well, give the kids something to do. He's clearly not of this world. I mean, was that what it was? You no, know? not so much that. It was like, well, you got to learn how to read or what, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with your life? You know, and he can't read. He's, he's going to be a laborer. He's going to be this or that. Well, all I knew is that the art that I was creating was was satisfying. It satisfied my soul as well as, you know, look at what I can do kind of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And as I got through college or I went through high school, I had some great, you know, high, my high school teacher was was very fun, Mr. Enemark. He he was in watercolor. He belonged to the Watercolor Society of America and, and California. And he had a he had a mark. He knew how to make watercolor sing. And so that early exposure was academic, but there wasn't any soul to it. You know, he was just giving out assignments and showing us and demonstrations, but he was, he was sparking us, you know, he was sparking a, a group of us in, in high school. It was only until I got into college that I realized, okay, I got to figure out what's going on here. And I had to stay in school because I didn't want to be, I was drafted. I had, my number came up and the only way I could avoid the Vietnam war was to stay in school. And so that was a Partly why I decided, okay, I've got to find a major and art is the only thing I know how to do. And that's it. You know, I said, okay, I'm going to, how are you going to make a living? Well, I'll teach. I'll teach art. So I taught for 25 years, but to get there was another journey, <laughs> was another journey you know? Yes. So the whole idea of trying to manipulate and hide my dyslexia and excel at, at what I was doing best, which was realism. And in 1960, 65, 66, photorealism became part of the, you know, the fine art scene or the scene. Right, right. It was the scene. Yeah. Yeah. That transitional period. And, and so my first painting class, I, I started, I worked in acrylic or a little bit before, before that was oils and watercolor primarily in high school. And a good friend of mine was, we were taking a painting class together and the instructor said, well, you know, we're going to uh, work on specific assignments and color assignment. You know, uh, we're going to do a complementary color. You get to use uh, two colors plus black and white. You know, so I use blue and orange and black and white. And I found this photograph of uh, a motorcycle. It's a Norton motorcycle. And I blew it up from this little ad from a magazine and I executed it. And that was kind of an initial kind of experiment with acrylic there were some other assignments prior to that but i got some recognition with it i get wow this is i finished this thing and they like it my instructors like it and they're showing it around and this and that the other thing so where do i go i keep i keep um this direction towards realism because it's what i felt i understood best i understood abstract painting like the work that you're doing i saw a show and I'm bouncing around here. I saw a show at the Berkeley Museum in 1969 of Franz Klein paintings. Oh, yeah. And they had opened up, the, the museum opened up, it's one on Bancroft that now is, a dec- uh, I guess it's condemned because the building's not safe. But I saw these four or five Franz Klein paintings, huge paintings, and it just struck me and I went, oh my God, this is, this is it. I have to do, I have to be part of this, this world or this, this thing. And I, I understood by looking at those paintings what abstract painting was about, you know, the emotional impact that yeah, that yeah. 
black and white can bring to there's no definition. It's the feeling, the soul that you that these paintings are creating. And I said, I got it. Okay, all right, good. Now, what are you going to do, right? (laughs) So within a few months, Bob Bechtel had a painting, and Bob Bechtel was a first-generation Bay Area photorealist, along with Richard McLean. And I'll talk about them a little little later. But there was a painting of uh, Bob's uh, called uh, 60 T-Bird. Oh, I know that painting. Yes, yes. And that one did it for me. I said, I have to do this. I have to paint like this. The thing about, I think, with Bob is he's a minimalist. He doesn't paint everything. That painting, the detail is uh, is not there. The accuracy, the draftsmanship, the light, all those other things are there. But the pebbles on the concrete and the yeah. dust, and the, you know, that's not there. He, yeah, he's his editing, that. his editing is is next level. I mean, yes. and it's it's crazy because I didn't realize, like, I just his work just holds together so beautifully. Mm-hmm. And then it's not, he's not stylizing anything, but I think I just right. realized when right. you were saying that that's, it's his editing and it's like a, a sort of under the surface simplification that holds through all the work that just makes it more potent. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love his work. So at the same time I'm going, all right, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. It's going to be fine art major. And, uh, so I get through at DVC, Diablo Valley College in, in the East Bay, uh-huh. I get through there. And then I wind up deciding where I was going to go. And I started taking classes from Mel Ramos at uh, Cal State Hayward. And I call it Cal State Hayward. It's Cal State East Bay something. And I apologize for, for that butchering of the name, but I always it's always Cal State Hayward. Uh-huh. And the thing was, everybody at Diablo Valley College was directing me. He said, Guy, you, you should go study with Mel. And at the time... I started a, pool, a swimming pool series, photorealism swimming pool. And it's people by the pool, what we bring to the pool. I did both watercolors and then acrylic. Now, I'm committed to working in acrylic. One, because it was inexpensive material at the time. Like, this is like 1969. It was cheap compared to, uh, to oil paint. And I had painted in oils, but I found that I was uh, allergic to the exposure of, of the oh, copal. Wow. Copals wow. and dryers and, oh. and turpentine. Is, is your work all acrylic still? All acrylic. I've, oh worked, my I've God. been working in acrylic since 69, so that's Dude. 50 wow. plus years. Oh, my God. I didn't know that. Wow. So rich. Yeah, it's it's been an interesting road. And I have to say that uh, acrylic, as we all know, you know, the great thing about acrylic is they dry fast. Yeah. And the bad thing about acrylic is they dry fast. <laughs> And so I've, over the years, I've had to select imagery that I had, I feel confident enough to paint and avoid what I can't paint, you know, so I'm editing there too. And, well, like what, uh, what do you mean? What can't you paint? What? Well, it's large. Now I've, I've kind of overcome this with certain techniques of, of doing a subtle gradation from light to dark, you know, and I do yeah. that. I do that now, but in early days, it was really, I was at the mercy of understanding the physics of these paints. And uh, they're, you know, they're uh, retarders they can use, and they're flow improvers that that you can you can use. The flow improver actually probably is the better medium to work with. And what it does, it makes water wetter, in that it breaks the water tension on a layer of paint, so you can spread it around, and you can blend very very quickly. You know, acrylic dry. I get five minutes to do this, right? So it doesn't it doesn't slow your it doesn't slow the drying time down. It slows the drying time a little bit. And then they have, you know, Golden's come out with these open acrylics. And I occasionally use those, but I'm still using the old school. Um, the flow improver, it, it, the best way I can explain it when I, was, when, I'm, when I was teaching was that, let's say you're out painting the trim on your house with an acrylic paint. Yeah. And uh, you come into an area that's been warmed by the sun and you take and you stroke your brush across and you feel that drag, right? Yes, yes, yes. That's yes. because the paint is is drying right. very quickly. Well, in Flow Improver, what it does is that, like I said, it makes water wetter and it doesn't necessarily inhibit from drying out. It just chemically changes. There's something or physical change changes and you get a few more minutes to to blend 
And um, that's how I've overcome certain, you know, certainly with my still life series of these very, very subtle transition from light to dark. Yeah, that's because I, I noticed that those backgrounds that, you know, just the lighting and wow, um, just that's amazing. But it's uh, what I use. You can you know, like Golden makes it and it's called Flow Improver or Flow Aid. Grumbacher makes it. Liquitex makes it. And what I use is Kodak. Photo flow, and I don't know if you're familiar with darkroom chemicals, but when you're developing film, the last thing you do is you put it through a bath of photo flow. One, and it, what it does is it prevents spots from from drying on your film while it's while it is drying. So again, it's making water wetter while it just sheets off. Well, that same reaction is going on when I'm working with acrylic. So if I have a large object to paint, but I work in multiple multiple layers, you know three, five, ten layers just to bring things up because things things dry. And, you know, the phone will ring and somebody will say, what are you doing? And says, oh, I'm waiting for paint to dry. I've got a few minutes. You want to talk? <laughs> you know, so, so but I, I think oil is the master medium. There's no doubt about it. And I think it, it I wish I, I wish I could have used it, but I'm so committed to oil or to acrylic paint now that, that I'm, I'm very comfortable, you know, taking on, um, challenges with it. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I hope we're, we're on track here, but in any case, yeah, no, it's just, uh, it's, I just couldn't believe that. Cause it, you're, it's the qual the richness and the subtlety. I'm pretty proficient with acrylic, but, um, I don't know, just the, just the subtlety and nuance of the color that you're getting, um, uh, just looks all, like oil. Yeah. And I don't know that I can explain it other than the fact that you know, I've been doing this you yeah. know, for, for 50 years. And yeah, yeah. I think that has something to do with it. <laughs> I think that that in part, you know, when you put your hours in, you make mistakes, of course. And I'm always happy to take on, you know, a challenge with mistakes built in. And um, with acrylic, it's a medium, I think, that has a longevity in a sense. I've got paintings here that are, you know, from 69 and 70, that motorcycle painting. It's as clean as, as the day I painted. There's no wow. crack in it. Wow. There's not, uh, yet maybe, you know, yellowing, there's, you know, pollution in the air will change colors. But but I had a little still life that I um, I did. And uh, it's it's amazing. It's flexible. You know, you could abuse it, of course. But yeah. But I, it doesn't have the same issues that you always have to take into account when you're trying to work with oil paint and speed up the drying time yeah, yeah. and force those dryers to, you know, do what they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm familiar with those pool paintings you were making, mm -hmm. sort of like larger and I... They they do feel like acrylic and you know kind of poppy colors and oh yeah that. yeah perfect that was like okay what am I I'm going to be a photorealist what am I going to paint and I'm a, I was a great uh, fan and still am and always will be of Wayne Tebow and and I remember listening to Wayne give a talk to to uh, while I was in junior college at at the DVC and and he says you know artists have subject they have three subjects they can paint people places and things that's it. Now, you can combine the two together. You can put people <laughs> and places together. You can put places and things together. You can put things, you know, you can combine them. And at that time, I said, well, you know, I think if I'm going to be, I have to, I have to do the human figure. I have to paint the human figure. I have to do it. You know, and the pool series was, was a way to do that. So that series was uh, from, I think, 73 to 80, 83. 84, 10 years that I, wow. I did these wow. pools. Wow. And, and um, they took a long time. They took between three to four months to do. And um, I got to the point where I said, well, you know, these aren't selling, you know, they're good, but, you know, I'm not making a great living at this. So, uh, you know, it's, we're talking about my starving artist decades, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was with uh, a gallery and, and, I decided to leave and I started working with Jeremy Stone, who uh, had a gallery in San Francisco. And she's a daughter of Alan Stone, who was uh, Wayne Tebow's dealer in New York. And someone said, someone said, you should, you know, you should 
approach uh, Jeremy and see you with your pool paintings. So I did. And she, she said, well, guy, well, let's, let's work with, let's work together. And that was in 85, I think. And about six months later, I changed to still life. I, I, I said, okay, enough of the pool series, enough of these four month paintings. I've got to do, I got to get more product out, so to speak. So I started to, to uh, do still life and the still life was, was really uh, generated from my looking at Gordon Cook and Gordon Cook was a contemporary of Tebow and, and part of the Bay area San Francisco scene. And, and he did these very simple one single object still lives and with these gray backgrounds. And I went, hi, this is it. I've got to try this. And then again, Wayne Tebow is a great influence and a number of other uh, Bay area artists. You had mentioned that you saw those Franz Klein paintings and just the, and and did that kind of, I mean, your work's nothing like that, of course, but how did that, you know, affect you? Like emotionally, I think when I saw the Franz Klein paintings, I said, I said to myself, I got it. I see what this is about. I see what abstract painting is about. And deep inside I'm saying, thank God somebody's doing this, you know, and jokingly, I'm saying now I don't have to, <laughs> you know, uh-huh, okay. <laughs> I can go on with what I'm doing, but no, I, I want to make it very, very clear that abstract art is, it is so emotionally charged on all directions on from the whole spectrum of, of, um, of emotions that we as humans enjoy, Yeah, 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 yeah. you know, and when I see a good abstract painting, there's nothing better. There's absolutely nothing better. And I think after, painting being a being an artist i have a good friend who is an abstract painter and she she and i get together and we talk for hours you know and we don't paint and alike at all you know she's she's very much an action painter and will take you know many many weeks to do a painting my paintings now they take you know a month you know four weeks to six weeks but the whole point i, I think i'm making is that when art is good you know it and you and you have to have a lifetime of exposure to decide mm. it for yourself mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and when i look at uh, you know Franz klein i think is one of my favorite of course de kooning of course and the group out of the 50s there was such a dynamic charge you know they're trying to change the world they really are it's post war and they're leaving europe behind to become independent of paris and and london Munich or whatever, and, and they've and the abstract expressionists come, German expressionists start to to build, you know, a palette for us to look at, and then non-objective painting. And like I said, I'll 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 seek out Franz Klein if I know there's one in in the area, I'll go see it. Yeah, you know? yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just, yeah. And I think it's the scale too. The scale is so dynamic, and even when he was doing little studies and phone book pages. Mel Ramos had one of those in his collection. And when I went over to his studio, he had it in the, uh, in his house. And I went, is that a Franz Klein? And he goes, yeah. And I just went, wow. You know. Yeah. Even at that scale, it has yeah. That potency. Yeah. And you know, a shoe polish on New York phone books and he did hundreds of them. And then he would, from those hundreds, he would, as far as I, I understand that, the process, he would say, okay, I can enlarge this. Wow. Interesting. That's another physical. How do you take, you know, a nine by 12 inch image and make it nine by 12 feet? Oh, with the same kind of abandon and right. Yeah. Right. So, so powerful. Yeah. And then, and I think, uh, I think my favorite period of art history is from Cezanne on post, mm-hmm. post impressionist. Yeah. You know, Modigliani is one of my favorite artists. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I can see why. So kind of continue on. You end, you sort of, I love the way that, you know, you have these choices. You, you, you've kind of ended up painting things, really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Landscape, landscape scares me. You know, that's like miles of depth. You know, I'm dealing <laughs> with like inches. <laughs> And the figure is always, you know, I, I should I should get back into just doing figure drawing. I mean, I I'm, I have no excuse. I mean, I should do it. But that's so funny how you see it. I I sort of 
I have that leftover sort of guilt. Like I see drawings that I've made in the past, you know, when I was, I, I, I actually could draw pretty well from life. You know, I can't imagine yeah. now. Um, I always feel like I need to, I need to do that. You know, it's like, it's the. Well, we should do that. You know, it's one of those things is that, yeah, it's kind of, we're just going to make records of our observation. We're not going to be, it's not going to be gallery worthy, right, you know, right, even art right. worthy, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. It's just sitting there and with a pencil and a piece of paper, make it as simple as possible and just draw what you see. Yeah. I have a friend, uh, I don't know if you know the uh, figurative landscape painter, Doug Andelin. No. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll send you a link sure. along. Um, actually, I think, oh, I did. I, I interviewed him for this podcast. I actually went with him landscape painting at Stinson Beach and interviewed him while we were painting. And oh, I painted right. too. I painted, but he's, I think he does like several life drawing painting things, two or three a week. I mean, yeah. this is what he does. He's so yeah. into it. He has one in Berkeley. He does one in his studio. So uh, maybe I'll, he keeps bugging me to come and do the one here. So I'll, I'll hit you up on that. Maybe you could come because sure. it's, uh, it, you know, he's, he has a model come and, and it's great just to sing all the drawings he makes. And, but, you know, when I look at your work, when I mm -hmm. look at the, the still lifes, I mean, there's a gravity to these things. And, and this is what's sort of interesting to me. I mean, it's very emotional. And I, I just wonder, like, it almost sounds like you were steering clear of the kind of wide open terrain of abstract expressionism or abstract <laughs> work, just kind of like to take a little smaller bite. But you don't feel like, I mean, your work is, it has tremendous there's humanity in it. And what, like, talk about that. Like, don't you think? I mean, yeah, well, I think, I think you're right. You know, when I started the still life series, I'm going to go, I said, well, how, what are you going to paint? You know, apples and oranges. I went through the apples and oranges and bananas and fruit for about two or three years. And Jeremy was showing those. And, um, I found that the influence that Gordon Cook had, of the simplicity, again, we're, this is a, this whole kind of thought of less is more. And I, I think it's part, it's more of my life now than it was, you know, back in the 80s. You know, I'm just trying to pull everything together. But I want to make a point first is that, you know, I graduate from San Francisco State with my, my master's in art. And I'm studying with Bob Bechtel and, and Richard McLean. And Richard McLean, uh, for the people who don't know, he's a first generation photorealist that painted horses. And yeah, it's unbelievable. And at that point, I was taking these. Uh, graduate classes with him and Bob and and I'm looking at these paintings that that Richard is doing and I said guy you know you're going to be teaching here and you got to tell your students at some point there's always going to be somebody that can paint better than you and once you surrender to that then you have the eye to see well what can this person as an artist show me to make my work better. And I got that from Richard because he is meticulous. He's, there's no better contemporary realist painter, in my opinion, because I studied with him. Of course, I loved it. I love working yeah, yeah, with yeah. him and getting everything out of him, you know, same with Bob. Bob is a little quiet and, 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 and Richard was, was open. You know, if you ask him what time it was, he'd have to build a watch first before he could tell you what time <laughs> it was, but it was always intriguing. Right. So, I said, okay, you know, I'm going to do this. And I start teaching part-time, always part-time, because California wasn't hiring uh, full-time instructors in the mm. 70s and 80s. But that gave me time in the studio. So I always had time in the studio to paint. Wow, that's great. Yeah. So back to your question about the still lives. I think once Jeremy had closed her gallery uh, in 90, I believe, and I started working with, at Modernism with uh, Martin Mueller, and I was doing, you know, still life at the time, and 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 Martin was uh, exposing me to Russian avant-garde art because he collects it, and, and through his gallery is able to find collectors to to purchase them. And I got very very intrigued with with the Russian avant-garde painters Malevich and and individuals like that. And I said, he and Martin said, you know, guy, you know, your compositions are very very similar to that. They're they're minimal. You know, why don't you want to think about referencing them? 
So that's where the whole series of referencing artists and, and trying to come up with compositions that complement their work. And uh, so there's a number of paintings that have reference to, you know, abstract painting and, and Modigliani and, right, and right. art in art history. So it's really about art about art. And, uh, but you, your comment about the emotion in the painting is, is I, want, I want to slow people down when they come to see my work. I want to slow their, yeah. their hectic day, you know, and, and I can go into a gallery and knock off the gallery in five minutes and, and walk out. And I'm sure people can do the same with my work because it's not what they're looking for. But for someone who's curious and someone who needs kind of a relief from, from the, the craziness in life, I'd like to think that my paintings provide some of that, you know, that it slows them down, allows them to it, it get, you know, be lured into the painting and say, oh, what's going on there? You know, and it's, there's symbolism and, and stuff, of course. But well, yeah, and, and the relationship between the forms and the shapes mm-hmm. and, and right. just the fact that, I mean, maybe it's a marble you're painting or part of a glove or something. Yeah. But because it's, you know, you spent two weeks on it, it has to be more significant <laughs> just yeah. because you've spent more time on it, but it's right. not, it's just a glove. So there's this juxtaposition of, of this is just a, these are just a bunch of things on a table and then they're, but they're much, much more than that. And I, and I think that's, that's something that's happening in your work. I mean, it's such a high level because of the craftsmanship and just the attention to the detail. And Well, that's interesting you say detail because I, I hate detail. I hate painting it unless I have to, you know, uh-huh. it's, it's there. I usually paint the most difficult part last, you know, oh, really? because yeah, because I kind of creep in on it. I teach myself how to get to it, you know, and doing the background first, the foreground and then objects and, Oh, well, there's certain object. Let's say if it's, yeah. A, Cause you, you probably don't need, you certainly don't need all of it. No, you don't. To give the feeling of, even though it's realism, right? I mean, right. Well, I just, I paint enough to be convincing. Ah. And I think I've heard there are many artists, uh, uh F Scott Hess, he, and I were showing together in, at Davis uh, Gallery in, in, near UC Davis. And, and he mentioned, he says, I only paint enough to be convincing. And I, I think that's exactly what, what I do. Because I love the brushstroke. I love seeing that mark. You know, I want to be able to show that I made a mark on the canvas. And a lot of times when detail gets so refined and so detailed, I don't have the patience for it, for one thing. But at the same time, if it's necessary to put wood grain in, I will put it in. If it's necessary to have a texture on a piece of, you know, a lemon or orange or or avocado or whatever, then I'll put it in and I'll surrender to it. I'll I'll, I'll surrender to the fact that it, okay, this is going to take five days just to do this one oh object within the yeah. painting. Yeah. yeah. But if I don't, it's going to fail, and I can't, you know, I can't uh, necessarily have that. You know, I think. Um, you find ways of, of simplifying and emphasizing. So one is, it's always about the complementary. You know, this has got to complementary complement that. And with that in mind, you know, it has a lot to do with light. You know, the light in my paintings, I think, is, is more important at, at times than the subject matter. Sometimes subject matter is mundane. It's very simple. It's a ping pong ball or a cue ball or, or a bottle of, you know, a simple generic bottle. But it's what the light is doing that creates that emotion. And you're crafting that light. Obviously you light the thing, but you're, you're creating this lighting, right? Yes. You're not copying it. You're, you're manufacturing this out of your head. Right. Now I want to make a point that I've, I've always from kindergarten on have used references, whether in terms of two dimensional reference photographs. So as I went through college, as I went through, through uh, my years of teaching you know, I always have classes, okay, we're going to draw from life today, you know, bring something interesting, and we're going to do watercolors. But for me, all of my work has always been photo oriented. And I think that that I'm considered a photo realist. But the term photo realism is in its purest sense is that it looks like a camera took it. The photograph is a source for me, obviously. So what I'll do is I will set up the still lives, have an idea of what I'm going to do. And then I'll, in the early days, I would just use a key light and a fill light 
and I take 20, 30, 40, you know, shots of, of film and then work from, from there and hope that I get one or two shots off a roll of film that actually work, uh, in terms of whether I want to commit to it for, you know, two, three weeks. Uh, now I'm working more with daylight and a good friend of mine, David Bishop, he said, guy, have you ever thought about working with daylight? And I went, no. And he's a photographer and he goes, well, come over to the studio. We'll set something up. And, and sure enough, when you start working with daylight in case of what I have in here in, in my home studio is that I go in the kitchen, I'll set up the table and the light comes in in the morning and it changes throughout the day. So I'll set up the still life, set up the camera and I'll go back about every hour and I'll re-photograph and maybe change things around. But that light changes through the day and it's, it's that light and the manipulation of light, you know, controlling it and using it like a lens where you can direct sunlight versus overcast day or whatever. So I'm always looking for what light can give these these simple objects that, that I choose to make. But, but your pictures will be a combination of all kinds of lighting, right? Yeah, I mean, you'll, well, in you'll some cases, You'll light that yeah. lemon a little bit more than maybe it's more of an afternoon light. And I mean, that's the artistry here. Once I commit to an image out of, let's say, 30 or 40 digital images, I went to digital Uh in in 2000, and I commit to the source image, and I'll have a a source image printed, and then um, I'll have it there to to work from. And I would say probably two-thirds of the painting is from that source image. And then as the the painting develops, it it either starts talking to you or it doesn't. You know, And, and, and when it doesn't talk to you, you go, come on, <laughs> tell me what you need. Tell me what you yeah, need. No, right, no, right. no. You got to fill this. You, there's too much white over. You got to fill in that white area. Get rid of that canvas. You know that kind. Of, and uh, but what I find is that the photograph leaves my sense of what's necessary in the painting. It helps 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 me get there. And I guess it's always been that way, even with the pool series. You fill in and you say, well, I'm going to enhance this. The painting's telling me it's talking back now and it's saying, you got to change that. You got to change this, you know, that area. And so you make up this balance of, uh, of what's working and what's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes I get 90% done with the painting and still not talking to me, you know, and I got to bring in the defibrillator, you know, and say, come on, tell me yeah. what you need. Yeah, right, right. And I'll have a friend come in and... And my girlfriend, she she would come, guy, you're gonna fix that area. And I go, what area? She goes, that area right there, it's not working. And I'd look at it and I'd say, God, you're right. You know, I've got to get in there. Yeah. And it's a fresh eye, you know, it's a fresh eye that people bring to to viewing the work when when it's being done. I'm hoping I'm I'm answering your question because I think again, light is this this emotion that my friend David sh- really exposed me to, you know, I mean, I was working with studio light, which was static. It was that way and it didn't change and I would have to move it around. But when you have natural light coming in, you get some other options that, and it's softer, you know, it's a softer. Yeah, yeah. Less contrasting too, so. Your selection, so... I mean, obviously you're adjusting and changing the lighting and, you know, because when I look at your work, it's just perfectly lit, you know, like I know that doesn't exist, but Mm -hmm. it's just, it's like optimal. It's optimized to just experience all these objects simultaneously in their most potent state, you know, so it's just not something you would like walk into a room and see that really. But what about the selection, like... How do you think about what you put in? And I know you've you've mm-hmm. gotten like you know a book on Matisse, and you'll include that, mm-hmm. and that that's sort of where you're, you're you know there's a sort of historical art history reference thing going on. But I mean, just like the feeling of a book, the spiritual feel of a book next to you know a, a knife, for example. Sure. You know, like these are objects, but they also carry with them sort of energy how do do you think about that and and how do you put this together i mean it's so much of your work happens in creating the still life right i mean in in setting it up i mean yeah oh yeah no i have to set it up i have to photograph it and i have to commit to it now photoshop helps with certain things you know in terms of 
isolating, yeah. ex, you know, changing exposure, whatever. I mean, I don't know how I did it when I was working with film because that's it. You didn't get anything else. I mean, do you have like a, you know, three closets full of stuff? Like if you're at a flea market, you're like, oh my God, I love that Greek urn and you just pick it up. I mean, I- well, that's just it. See, there's, to me, objects come with a, a cliche. Ah. And I've got to be aware of that. And most of the objects in my paintings aren't decorative or they're not, you know, symbolic so much. You know, I wouldn't paint a Coke bottle. You know, I'd rather just paint a simple, you know. So it's that nostalgia. And there are many, many artists that love to paint nostalgia in the objects they, they choose. With me, I have to get past that. I have to just, these are just shapes. These are just geometric shapes in space with light on them. And when I incorporate an art history reference, whether it's a a postcard of a of a Van Gogh or a Modigliani or or keep bringing him up because again my favorite one of my favorite artists of that period, but it's like keep it simple, guy. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Don't don't fuss with things. You know, if you're going to use things, use use it in such a way that it's going to complement the important objects in, in the painting, you know, uh, that's where detail comes in too much detail versus not enough. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I, and the thing about, about some of the, the fruit of the painting, I just clip it off the tree, which brings the, the, uh, the fruit and the leaves and the branch. And that to me is, is pure, you know, there's no cliche to that. It's just, I'm, I've taken this branch and I'm trying to work with it in such a way rather than, let's say, going to Safeway and buying a, a bag of oranges, you know, which I've done as well. But but I think it's trying to cut through the cliche. Yeah. Is it like, I mean, I get it. If you paint a Coke bottle, suddenly this whole painting is telling a different story. I mean, Coke carries with it. So it's kind of like, what's what's the essential nature of a vessel or a bottle, you know, like when I think of Modigliani, I think of like those, they're not, they're just icons almost of, they're a stand in. Is that what you mean? Um, well, the art, art about art series is specific to the artists I've chosen to play reference yeah, to. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But I mean, I guess, I mean, you're looking for the essence of those objects, So they get to speak more truthfully and not about something that's a side tangent, you know? Yeah. Well, if you take the marbles, you know, they've been the significant part of of this this current series. And they're large glass marbles or even steel balls that have been, you know, polished. And, you know, they're an unstable thing. In the current work, uh, if we can go there, the Dutch still life painters always had things hanging off the edge of the table, you know, be just right on the edge. Yeah, right. Any right. movement. Well, it's basically to say all of this abundance that I've acquired and all these things and this and that, but life is short and it's precarious. And so the marble in my paintings are this precarious element that says, ah. hey, hey, you know, live your life. Life is short. Enjoy what, you know, is important to you, the family you have, the friends you have. And um, uh, that's a significant thing, you know, to have these things right on the uh, tension. It's a real tension, yeah, yeah, but, it, yeah. but I've got to control how much of that that I want. And that seems to be within the last maybe two years. And uh, prior to that, the marbles were being incorporated into uh, along with a, a glass bottle half full with with water, you know, so they kind of complement because they're side by side. So it's it's all compositional trickery in a sense that I've got to get this flow and rhythm together, and you know, placing objects uh, is fun. It's really yeah, yeah yeah. I mean, it's it's funny, you know, moving the goalposts of what you take on closer almost creates more opportunities. I mean, you know, like you could, you know, you could live for another 300 years. I could see you just keep on like what next objects and, you know, just, just that idea of, well, then there's objects that hold things and like glass is really actually like a glass of water, you know, all, all, all that starts to come into it. One thing I wanted to mention is that I've been 
associated with Magnolia Editions in in uh, Oakland. Yeah, Farnsworth's. Uh, yeah, John yeah, Farn- yeah, Don yeah. Farnsworth and Don and I get together every week, and and wow. I, I go there, uh, and we hash things out, and and there's always subject matter to think about, and what are we going to do next, you know? But but I wanted to bring them up because uh, that integral part of of working with Don at, at Magnolia has allowed me to to meet artists that come in to to work on a project and and be part of that you know and and I think that uh, Don provides quite a uh, as we're calling it now a alchemy you know yes. because they're so involved with printmaking and ceramics and tapestries and stuff and just the man the the line of artists that have come through I've always fantasized about uh I've never even been to Magnolia Press, yeah. which is crazy. You know, it's right, oh, yeah. it's right here. Yeah, but right. you know, all the work they did with Chuck, all those artists, Squeak Carnwath, Chuck Close, all yeah. you know, it's just uh it's it's like the best part of art making is when you can get out of your studio and, and well, share exactly. it, you know. And I guess the point that point is that, you know, it reinvigorates me to go in once a week and, and kind of just do things there that I wouldn't do here in the studio. It's wow, like I you go break. in every week. That's yeah. impressive. Yeah, I've been going there for 30 years, off and no, on, off no and on. Kidding. It's only been about the last, well, maybe five years that Don says, just come on in. You know, we'll figure out something to do. We'll get in trouble. You know, we'll make mistakes and, and make uh and from those mistakes, we'll make some good stuff. <laughs> wow. That It'll be is art so worthy, cool. you know? That's so cool. Do you, do you sell some of that work that you generate? I do, yeah. They, yeah well, I know I, they do, but. Yeah, well, everything that they, that I've done with them in addition, you know, addition prints and tabs. Yeah, they get some Are of those. available there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, the, the other thing I was, I wanted to talk about, uh, Don is, has given me reason to change it up you know, scale mm. or work on paper. He's recreating a 16th century Renaissance paper from linen, which is what it was made from during that period of time. Uh, linen paper is an incredible uh, material to to draw on. It's very robust. Wow. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, but my point is that through the pandemic, obviously we weren't getting together as much. And, and this whole uh, takeout only series was uh, still lives that I've done and it came about from, well, what do I do next? You know, and, and with Don saying, well, you know, we're closed down here, you know, uh, why don't you, you know, we'll, we'll get back to you and we'll figure out something. And so I got to think, well, God, what, do, what am I doing? How can I contribute? How can I make a, make a point of, of this, you know, issue that, that we're all living through. And uh, so Still life turned into these still lives of takeout only food packages, pizza boxes yeah, and yeah. cups and, you know, take out this, that and the other. And so I was going to the recycle here in my building and I saw all these things that people were throwing away. And I went, well, I'm going to carefully take these home and sterilize them, <laughs> get them ready to to set up as, as still lives. So I've done about 12, 12 paintings in that series. Yeah, that's so cool. And they've been... They've been accepted. You know, I thought it was, you know, talking about being a cliche, you know, I thought, yeah, but I think you need to do this. Yeah. You well, know? I love the thinking and it's so yeah. current and. Yeah, it and is. And I'll continue. You know, I'm doing some drawings on, on Don's paper with these, with these objects and paper cups. And, and it's, it's amazing the variety of, of takeout containers that, that are interesting to the point where you can go, well, we, you know, it's not just the pizza box, you know? Wow. That's, that's amazing. Huh? Wow. Well, so kind of in wrapping up here, I just, I mean, there's so much, boy, we're going to have to reschedule it for another, another well, I'd time. I'd love there's to so, do it again. Yeah, yeah. There's so much uh, more to talk about, but maybe just what's coming up for you that you're excited about that we can kind of look forward to. I know you have shows every year or two uh, at Dolby Chadwick, but what? Yeah, I have, uh, I'll be having my sixth, show with Dolby Chadwick next, let's see, October of 20, what, three. Yeah. Oh, okay. Of 23, okay. not this coming. Okay. And uh, I'll have obviously new work for that. Gives me plenty of time to pull things together. And uh, my current work, you know, working with, with Don on making paper and doing drawings on this paper and uh, just working, you know, I think 
I wanted to make one point is that when somebody asks, you know, guy, when are you going to retire? And I go, retire from what? And I go, this is what I do. I get up in the morning, I have some coffee, where I go for a walk, have some coffee, you know, do a little internet and try to get away from the internet and then have lunch. And then I'll, I'll put in, you know, some time at, at the easel, have dinner and then come back and I'll, I don't know, work at night as well until it's time to go to bed. But uh, the main thing is I, if I can leave a thought with, with artists and even student art artists and, and people who are just getting started is I always have to have a painting on the easel. I have to have yeah. something to work on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do one painting at a time. I, I don't generally oh, interesting. do. interesting. Wow. It's just one. I put six weeks uh-huh. into it and I try to work every day if I can. And, but what scares me is not having that painting on the easel because mm. I know me. <laughs> I know me well enough to that I can be distracted with other things that I'm uh, obviously involved with and want to be. But that painting over there at the easel is drawing me. It's, you know, the brushes are calling. Yeah. You know, and and I sit down and as hard as it can be at times, I sit down and I go, this is where I have to be. And so I'll go and I'll go on a trip, you know, whether it's a week or two weeks or a month. But I know when I get back, there's going to be a painting waiting for me to waiting, start, yeah. rather than having to start a new painting. That's the scary part. So even if I'm leaving for a trip, I'll have something started. All right. That's awesome. And that's what keeps me going. I mean, I remember Mel Ramos, uh, I would meet him over the years, and he would say, well, how are you doing? I went, so I'm doing pretty good. And he says, are you are you're painting, right? And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, are you having fun? And I uh, said, yeah, because dude. he would always say that. I wouldn't do yeah. this if I, if it wasn't fun. I just, I'll hold it up for you right now. This is, I just, I put this on my table. It says, have fun, have more fun. Yes. I just wrote that the other day because it was like, this is all <laughs> getting too serious, you know? Like, oh my God, I got, da, 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 you know? It's okay to be serious, but we know where yeah. we have to be as artists, right? I mean, I'm an only child and uh, I love the people in my, my family, you know, in my, yeah. my uh, immediate family. And, and they know when I say, oh, man, I know this painting, I need to work on the painting tonight. I'm afraid I'll have to take a rain check. And they know that, you know, yeah. and they'll tease me about it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but they know that, and I want to be able to maintain that. Uh, for my days, you know, the re- the rest of my days. That's super awesome. Listen, Guy, thanks so much for uh, sure. just sharing this time and your wisdom and your knowledge. And obviously, folks listening, if you go to arttolife.com and click on podcasts, you can see um, all some of this, some of this work, the recent stuff, but some of the other stuff is really amazing. So check all that out. And I, Guy, we're going to have to do uh, part two of this because uh, yeah, I'd love to, God, I'd love to talk know. about, you know, uh, ah. my teaching days. I mean, yes, I have, yes. And then, I would love that, you know, workshops. I haven't done a workshop in some time, but, yeah. but, um, now you're in, you're in Sausalito, right? Yeah. Yeah. I work okay. out of Sausalito. Yeah. Okay. Cause I'm here in Marin too. So we can. We can totally. get together, have coffee. I would, and, I would love that. I put them over that. to to my humble little home studio here. Sounds good. All right, man. Well, listen. Thanks so much. Hey, thanks for listening to the Art to Life show. If you enjoyed the podcast, please help me get the word out by sharing it with your friends on Instagram at Art to Life underscore World. The recording of this and all episodes, along with a place to leave comments, see additional photos, and discover a whole new approach to making art can be found by going to arttolifepodcast.com. And secondly, if you could leave a rating and review in whatever app you're listening on today, I would super, super appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And last but not least, before you go, if you'd like to be on my artist list, every Sunday morning I send out a video blog all about art making. Go to arttolifepodcast.com to sign up. And all these links are in the show notes, of course. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.